Hello, you delightful delinquents. It is I, your Papa Jaffe. Good to see you. Welcome to a new format, at least a test format, of Gabbin and Games. This is kind of like uh, speed running the video game news. It's not like crazy hyper kinetic. Let me know what you think uh, in the comments. I have that thing in my voice now, and I get, if I cough or clear my throat, it's going to go away, but I want to keep it forever. What if, what if you were like watching a... Uh, romantic comedy and the girl loved that and it's like dude you got to fucking drink some water. I can't dude She fucking loves it when I talk. It doesn't really matter Mandalorian video game is canceled. You saw EA laid off 5% of its staff They also part of that was getting rid of the Mandalorian I don't know if Stig was directing that one I cannot imagine they laid Stig off who was the director of the last two Jedi games which were beautifully received wonderfully successful but they looked at the Mandalorian and said Hey, man, no. Uh, it's weird, though. I wonder if that was what they were making in place of a new uh, Jedi game or if that's still rolling and this was kind of a secondary thing. Here's the thing. I mean, some information's come out about it. I haven't... I know it was rumored to be first person. I don't know if that was ever confirmed or not. But what I do know uh, is the rumors are hitting that it was very early, but it had been play tested. They had vertical slices up. People at the studio and gamers that were just kind of brought in uh all said it was really fun really cool you did not play whatever the guy's name is from the show uh jin jin or fucking whatever uh the d is silent uh why why you don't play that guy you play just one of the mini mandalorian uh maybe you customize your own who the hell knows and you had like a base of operations and you could go to different planets and you know go after specific bounties that you chose and there will be other ai bounty hunters coming after those people as well and you were fighting stormtroopers and the combat apparently because of the jetpack that you have was very fast and uh over the top uh there were like doom killing moves doom eternal killing moves not that violent of course these are the rumors that have just come out today uh from a number of video game websites saying this is kind of what it was we're learning what it was it sounds you know the fact that people said it was really here's what i'll say the fact that people said it was really good when they played it and it's also coming from what was coming from respawn i have every reason in the world to believe that it would have been great uh it sounds kind of less like a I, again, I'm just going by what people are saying about it, but it doesn't sound like one of those games that it's like, here's this deep story of the Mandalorian character you play, and there's tons of cutscenes and blow. It it kind of feels like a, a a PS2, PS3 era action game, if what they're describing is kind of the core of what it was, or all of what it was, which is you're this guy or girl, whatever, and pick missions and go solve them, and you get goods, and then you can use the stuff you earn, uh, Baskar Steel, who the fuck knows, credits, and build your dude up. It was was not an open world game it was more linear i guess you would pick the planet you want to go to and then it was more i don't know if it was kind of like it sounds like it might have been more like ratchet and clank level structure which is openy but it's not open like grand theft auto or star wars outlaws or whatever which in a lot of ways you go hey that kind of sounds like a good double a game good to see ea embracing that maybe that was the problem they're like look we greenlit this when we kind of thought that was a business model but even if it's very profitable Given what we're spending on it, let's say 60 million, I'm totally making all this shit up. I don't know if it's true. I know all the stuff I told you about what the game is. That That's the rumors out there. But in terms of how much they spent, I'm just saying that a lot of reasons the big companies don't make the AA games is because the profitability isn't enough for them. So perhaps if my read of what the game is is correct, that it was almost more like a really polished but scope-wise AA game, uh, maybe they're like, even if we hit a home run, it's not really going to matter. And we can put these same people on titles like Apex Legends or the new Jedi game that will have a greater chance of making a lot more profit. And this makes more financial sense. Pour one out for the good Sir Mandalorian or the good man Mandalorian, however you wanted to create your character or the good just non-binary Mandalorian. Those exist too. This is the way. But that's dead to the world, sadly. I'm sure some footage will emerge from it. Uh, as as tends to happen in video games. I'm curious to see it. Always sucks to have a game canceled. It's heartbreaking. Absolutely heartbreaking. You pour your soul into it and you just, you have to live in this weird place of denial that it's just, you're going to will it into existence. And it's totally out of your control. It's totally, the, the reason that this game was canceled sounds like every decision they made could have been right. And it was people above their pay grade that, that are looking at these things as widgets and which I guess is their job. And they're just like, yeah, no. Oh, I've, I've, I've had a game canceled a couple of times, not a lot, but a couple of times. And every time you're just like, it just shatters your reality, breaks your heart. You get sad for a while, but they'll come out of it. They're talented developers, but still death to the Mandalorian. Come on now. Don't be dramatic. I, well, excited for the uh, Dragon's Dogma 2. I am. 
I'm excited for Dragon Dogma. I uh, can't even say it, though. I'm excited for Dragon's Dogma 2. I didn't play the first one. second one looks great. Uh, I've read a lot of interviews with the director and the team. It sounds like there's really cool stuff happening. My mom won't let me play it, though. Granted, she's dead and she won't know, but I still have to do what my mama says. ESRB came out today and said, this is getting a goddamn cock M because it's got strong sexual content. Here's what it says. Dragon's Dogma 1 apparently didn't have any of this, but the sequel has sexual themes tagged. I'm reading this on IGN. It says, likely because players can interact with sex workers exchanging currency for services. A brief sequence depicts the player sitting on a bed with a prostitute is that i thought i thought we say sex workers now i don't i don't mean that like i'm trying to shame anybody for saving the you know but people who are in the sex work industry have said they prefer sex worker does it matter to you i don't know it matters to me i like to respect people but whatever call them what you want do it and what you want but they'll probably charge more if you don't call them the thing they want so a brief sequence depicts the player sitting on a bed with a sex worker both wearing underwear before the camera fades to black. I like how they had, to, it's, it's kind of like those movies where they're, they're having sex and uh, they, they're after sex, the guy gets up and the sheet just falls off of him. But for some reason, the woman's like, I just suck and you just me in the hole. Uh, but let me cover my boobs up. Come on, come on. Uh, anyway, face to black. One cutscene briefly depicts characters kissing and rolling around in bed. No nudity. Uh, two monsters are shown with bare breasts, though with no discernible details, i.e. no nipples. God, we are a crazy country. <laughs> it's like... Uh, Blood and gore language violence tags are in there too. One cutscene in the game and a spoiler warning says IGN for those looking to come in completely fresh. Look, I've read it. This is not going to kill anybody when I tell you this. It depicts a dragon pulling out a character's heart while another shows a monster decapitated in slow motion. Oops, spoiled it for you. Come on, man. So there you go. It's getting itself an M. Uh, I don't think it's going to matter. doesn't really matter. I do think, let me check something real quick. I use the power of editing, the power of editing uh, to check the number of games last year that were the biggest hits and see what rating my guess i think i think they're i think they're they were t this time but i could be wrong i'll get back to you in two seconds i'll get back it'd take me 10 minutes but i'll get back to you and you're shut up my god they understand like they've never did a video or something i know thank you god for calming me down thank you god i mean god I don't know, wherever you... Okay, so I put in what rating did most hit video games have in 2023? E for everyone last year was the most assigned age rating. All right, this year so far, how about that? Uh, Final Fantasy's top rated T, Bellatro T, Last of Us, of course, is M, Persona is M, Like a Dragon is M, Tekken is T, Prince Persia is T, Spirit Hunter, something, never even heard of that. That's an M, Apollo Justice T, Little Guardsman T, something I can't pronounce, Sheeran, Ed Sheeran, that's an E, and Solum Infernum, Solium Infernum uh, is a T, so it, it does look like most of them are uh, T's, are the, uh, the, the, the most released uh, games, with some E sprinkled in there, so, anyway, whatever the point is, uh, if you want to play the Dogma Baby, you got to be okay with an M rating. Helldivers 2 uh, director came out and was talking about a lot of people debating the stats of items in the game in Helldivers 2, especially the weapons. Uh, there's been reports of people who come into a battle with uh, other teammates and they don't have the weapon that the leader wants them to have. It's not the best weapon according to that individual. And so they kick him out of the game and shit like that. The director comes out and says, you know, just don't worry about it. All the guns have about 40 extra stats anyway. It's not just damage, recoil, reload speed. There's a bunch of shit under the hood that you don't know about. We don't want you to know about, but it's designed. It sounds like to make the guns pretty much balanced. I mean, sure, this is better than that. This is better than that in this area. But he's like, his quote is use the one you like the most the numbers are a guideline which is which a is is cool it's good to know that um but the thing that interests me though is all the numbers under the hood in video game tuning that really you don't want to know about like there are some hardcore people according to this article at games radar that are like oh some of the fans are saying no we want to see all the stats and you know developers like no they're not for you but regardless though there are probably stats like collision volume of the spread for uh, the breaker shotgun, you know, think, you know, and if they gave it to you, you'd be like, oh no, that's unbalanced because a lot of people say that gun's too powerful, whatever. But there's also a lot of things that developers do that are total cheats to make you feel like a better player. Uh, and if they gave that away, it would probably be like, hey, 
You know, I'm not as good as I thought I was. I mean, you're better than other people who at the game, but a lot of things are tuned to make it seem fair, but it really is meant to make it fun. And you just don't, uh, you just don't really know about it. It's one of the reasons, you know, people ask us all the time, why didn't the cars fight each other in Twisted Metal 2 and on? And it's because it took the gameplay away from the player, right? It's like we, we could have found a better solution than just to not have them fight. But what would happen is you'd be driving around and you could just avoid everything and let them take care of the battle. And one could say, well, yeah, in today's age, that's a valid design choice. That's a valid play choice. But certainly back then, it would have been, it would have come across like, you know, you would have gotten dinged in reviews like, uh, we discovered a way you can totally cheese this whole fucking game. So, you know, we put in things to make sure that if they did happen to fire a missile, and if the missile was going to do more damage to the enemy car that happened to get hit, uh, that would have taken away a percentage of health that would have brought the car down to under 30% or something. It just did it may, played an explosion, but there was no damage. Or, so, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you probably don't want to know is happening behind the scenes. But that said, though, I do think this is really interesting. And I, and I like the mentality. You know, I like the mentality of the directors. Like, dude, it's not like that. Um, I don't know if he's just spinning or if it's true, but, you know, people are loving the game so far. No one's complaining that it's pay to win. Uh, so maybe it is true, which would be amazing. So good on them. And uh, I thought that was cool. Speaking of stats and whatnot, there's an article on uh, VG247 about the interview that uh, uh, Miyazaki did, uh, the director of Elden Ring and the, the DLC that he did with the Japanese magazine Famitsu. Remind me sometime to tell you about my Famitsu experience. Uh, it used to be one of the biggest, most respected video game magazines in Japan. It might still be, but it's. I'll, I'll tell you sometime. So I played Bloodborne, and then I played a little bit of the DLC, the New Hunters or Dark Hunters, whatever it was called. But I didn't play enough to really form an opinion about how From Software does their DLC. Well, I guess one of the problems that their games have had, if you want to call them problems, is that if it... I'll just read you. He explains it better than I could. The article says, typically jumping into the DLC of From Software games makes this right are cautious due to difficulty in scaling. Uh, but El uh, Elden Ring Shadow of the Erd Tree fixes that. So I guess what he's saying is if you come in and your character was defined a certain way based on where you put your stats, they're kind of having to guess the enemy encounter uh, order and the enemy encounter difficulty based on where they think most players might be with certain stats, but there's no way to know because you have all this freedom based on how you spec'd out your character. And so people are gonna experience different levels of difficulty. The article by uh, Sharif Sayed says, usually DLC difficulty on From Games is on par with the main game's in-game. If you took the time to optimize your build, you'd have the best shot experiencing the new content at a fair level. But this guy says he doesn't always do that, so he would always feel underpowered. The new game apparently takes, according to Miyazaki, inspiration from another From game, uh, Sekiro, which I have not played. Our very own Ricardo is continually telling me, play that fucking game. It's his favorite game of all time, and I will. I should. But in that game, I guess when you kill the boss, that's the only way you really ever level up, and then you can choose. You can up your health or the damage you do or your posture, and it's and maybe there's some others, but that's kind of the core. And so he, he goes on to say, I suspect taking down mini bosses and other non-major enemies across the world... Uh, uh, would be how you earn the permanent boost to your power, a sort of codified, more straightforward way of power progression, if you will. The approach also leaves room for players looking to experience a greater challenge to simply go into the DLC's toughest fights without obtaining any powers, so you can imagine all the runs we're going to see uh, where players specifically avoid the new mechanics or finish the DLC with unmodified characters from the first game. So, it's kind of a cool solution. We'll see uh, how it plays. I, I, I have to fucking beat the first game. Um, this is where I'm at in the first game. Check this out. All right, shut up about her not wearing any clothes. It's not because I'm a pervert. I mean, maybe I am, but uh, it's more to do with, or all to do really with the idea of I need her to roll really fast because I don't have the skill to go toe to toe with these bigger monsters. So dodging's pretty much the best I can do. I've been stuck on this motherfucker right here for, uh, goodness, I don't know, a week. And I don't see it getting better anytime soon, but I really got to fucking finish this thing because I want to be able to play the DLC when it comes out. Hell, I want to play Dragon's Dogma first, so I have about two weeks to fucking wrap this up. I, 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 I will not give up. I hear I'm about four bosses, give or take, away from the end, and there's a boss right after this one. I'm so tired of this game. I love it so much. It's my favorite game of all time. 
Um, but I'm so tired. I'm so tired. Every I mean, I'm I'm old, man. Let me slow the fucking game down. I don't I don't need an easy mode. But my God, I'm 52. My reflexes ain't what they used to be. Help a man out, Jesus. Anyway, looking forward to this one. Looking forward to the DLC. Uh, and this DLC is coming out in june so i have a little time not a lot of time i gotta get on this shit man uh check this out square enix reveals foam stars <laughs> kids face bullying over in-game items and skins a study suggests this is sad but i have something to say on this so it's an article i'm reading it in vgc but there was a, a study done in norway saying that these kids they're feeling pressure to buy skins and pressure to if you if you're playing on wi-fi and you're not wired and the study goes on to say that some kids may end up feeling excluded if they lack resources examples gaming equipment in-game currency to play with their friends or might get picked on based on what skin they're wearing kids are out humans are assholes that's the goddamn truth um, but then they go on to compare. They say it's important when you're comparing video games to other leisure activities among kids in the real world. They were saying that in video games, these stores are constantly advertising to you in between matches and shit. But yeah, in football, you have banners and things like that, but it's not as in your face. And I'm like, you know what? Fuck you. Fuck you. You know what bad about fucking, you know, I would rather if I were my kids were kids again, and I was raising them. I would rather them have a little stigma from a video game. Uh, than, than one of those, like, you never get picked until last at gym class. Gym class is a nightmare. What is this show about? I don't know. I didn't like gym I mean, I didn't hate. I liked kickball. Did you like kickball? It says social influence was added to the commercial pressure where kids wanted to stay updated on skin trends and belong amongst gaming peers. I mean, God. When, when do we evolve? When do we get to evolve as people? And just, it's like, you know what? First off, let's be clear. You know what message needs to get out there to kids is most of the people, hint, that have some money in the bank are the people that you wouldn't know because they don't fucking spend it. I drive a 2003 Toyota Corolla and I'm going to drive that motherfucker until it, the wheels fall off. Hopefully I'm not going very fast uh, because it's good enough and I get to save money and in save money is freedom. The only thing you need to spend your money on is freedom, people. Come on, stupid fucking kids. Then again, they live in Norway. What's that about? <laughs> Listen to this. It says, um, the report studies the impact of games on kids uh, and found gaming market integrates with everything else they do in life with no sharp distinction between the online and offline world. The difference is they're all white. I don't even think they let you in the Norway if you're not the the white. Maybe they're running around. It's like, geez, I'm so tired of being white. Who, who says that? No one. Not in America, anyway. Can you imagine a white guy's like, I'm really tired of being white. <sighs> you guys want some more news? Our very own Victor Lucas. I don't know why he's our very own, but I like the guy. I like the cut of his jib. He's a good human. Uh, starting this Saturday, Electric Playground is back. Victor announced today that Electric Playground is coming back every week. They're going to put a new episode starting at the very first one, going all the way up to the end of the season or into the series. Looking at this trailer uh, is crazy to me because th this was my time in the business. This is when I was sort of in my heyday in the business, starting and really kind of getting going. Uh, it's crazy to see all these people that I know, that I worked with. So this is exciting, but I also want to tell you that this Tuesday... Victor is coming on the show. We're going to do a long form interview. I believe he's going to be open to taking questions. I need to double check that, but that will be happening very, very soon. Uh, hell, it's happening Tuesday. So hopefully we'll see you there. There's good Sir Tommy. Hey, there's Kiss. They had a lot of fucking people on this goddamn show. It starts tomorrow on their YouTube channel. They're airing it at nine. Victor's going to watch it with people, uh, but you can watch it obviously whenever you want. But I'm going to I'm going to get up tomorrow and watch it. I don't know if it's okay if I live stream watching it. I need to ask him that. Oh my God, look how young we all were. That's Ted Price. There's Mimoto. Naomi Kyle. Wait. Wait, is that Zoe Flower? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's find this out. Okay, that's Zoe Flower? It looks like Naomi Kyle. Did you see Naomi Kyle is back on uh, the goddamn cockadoo the IGN? But anyway, hopefully you'll join me and Victor in a, uh, a chat and call in with your questions coming up on Tuesday. Well, obviously the big uh, game of the week, maybe game of the year, 
Final Fantasy Rebirth, a sequel, of course, to or a continuation of the story that ended with uh, Final Fantasy Remake. Is that what it was called? And then there's a little intermission thing. Now, listen, this is sitting at a 92 Metacritic right now, and it's sitting at a 95 Metacritic for users. Everyone says it's phenomenal. It's so big that I'm just like, oh, my God. I don't know if I'm going to be able to actually ever finish it. Uh, but I will tell you the hype has kind of caught me up because it does look really good. And, and I'm just like, you know what? I, I, I got I to gotta at least see what the fuss is about so i downloaded uh final fantasy uh remake today on ps5 i had never played it uh i just played through chapter one where you take down the reactor and i'm like okay this is pretty fucking good no shit jaffe but anyway this is out today uh chocobos and tifas i know there's only one and tifas look what i did <laughs> liberal progressive yeah listen to me this is it this is the shit everybody's talking about it give it a play if you're interested it is on at least final fantasy uh remake i believe is still on playstation plus one of the tiers so wow i like her she's my girlfriend but this is out let me know what you think in the comments i'm sure you love it. i mean here's what i'd be curious about who doesn't love it who who doesn't love it but played it and doesn't love it because i'm sure there are people who just don't like the 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 franchise that's fair but i wonder if people are like yeah there's like so much fucking wrong with this but so far it's just god that looks good god that looks good come on now come on now uh yeah i mean well one more little note to kick off your final fantasy 7 uh weekend if you go to the google check it out they're always taking care of us yeah they steal our data and yeah they are going to destroy the world and be evil but they do nice things for us to distract us like this. Check it out. Chocobo, uh, Chocobo, whatever the fuck they're called, the little bird things, big bird. Uh, if you type it into the Google, you'll get a little yellow thing down here that pops up after a second. Just click on that. Just just click on it. I don't know how long this is going to run, so I'll show you what happens. Oh my God, what's going on? Well, it's a bunch of cartoony Chocobos. And check this out. If you keep pressing the button, which of course you're going to do. Let's see. I think we get a couple more of them. Let's pl press, press it again. Come on now. Right, look at that. We got some clouds on there, right? Let's see. I haven't done it more than that. Let's see if we get any Tifas or uh, uh, Eris or Sephiroths or... Come on now. Is it just cloud? That's still pretty good, though. All right, well. Clicky, click, click, click. Come on. Give me give me some more of the characters. You got to give me something in there. Oh, my God. Nah, it's just cloud still. Beggars can't be choosers. Isn't that a nice thing they did for us? You got damn right. Uh, check it out on the Google. Listen, you have to have seen this. Uh, Grand Theft Auto Five, which we know is coming out well, who knows when, but it should be next year at this point. It looks great. The first game, I think, sold like almost 200 million copies. That's a game that has made over $8 billion. Come on. The Rockstar people say, hey, you guys got to come back into the office. They've been working at home since the pandemic. This is reporting from little Jason Schreier. I'm reading it from the Business Insider article. They've been working from home and they were vibing with it so much and feeling they were being all super productive and whatnot that even last year, uh, 170 of them signed a petition uh, with Rockstar because I guess they had heard through the grapevine that Rockstar was considering shifting the way they were working now that the pandemic was over. And they were like, no, here's this petition. Was it just QA? Was was it programmers? Was it producers? Who the fuck knows? I don't know that. But they're like, hey man, don't change this. This is working. We're happy. Well, they don't care if you're happy. They just care if they're happy. And they're only going to be happy if GTA 6 ships on time and it's not a disaster like Cyberpunk that they got to spend two years making better or even worse, it just falls flat and doesn't connect. And so I think they're bringing them back. They cite uh, security issues, which makes some sense because these guys have suffered a couple leaks over the last couple years. But beyond that, they're citing productivity issues, which, yeah, games like Spider-Man 2, really well-produced games and games that are built on the bones of previous games that they already kind of know what Spider-Man is. And yeah, they're adding a lot of stuff to the sequel, but it's still built on something they already knew. I'm not saying that's the only way to do it. And that's the only way you can be successful doing AAA from home, but certainly to just trot out Spider-Man and say, oh, because it was Spider-Man, they did it. Anyone can do it. And also Insomniac has historically been a very well managed company and a very well anti-feature creep company. Can't really say that about Rockstar. You can't certainly say that about Grand Theft Auto. Strass Zelnick, the CEO of Take-Two is like, well, you know, we're aiming for perfection. Well, I get that coming back into the office is going to add to that perfection. The employees aren't happy, of course. They weren't happy when they signed the petition, worried about it. Now that it looks like it, it wasn't just a rumor, here's what they say. This is an anonymous rock star employee talking to the Independent Workers Union of Great Britain. After so many broken promises, we now fear management may even be paving the way for return to toxic crunch practices. Of course they are. 
what do you got rocks in your head what do you got rock stars in your head yeah who would you put in your head if you could have rock stars in there i don't know what they would do but i would put taylor swift you'd say oh, she's a pop star i put phil collins he can't move around though but he can still play the he can play the drums he can sing anyway after so many broken promises we now fear management may even be paving the way for a return to toxic crunch practices senior leadership needs to rethink their reckless decision making and engage with their staff to find an arrangement that works for everyone no I don't disagree with the heart of what this guy's saying, of course. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. But, you know, this is like, what is that? that what's that story about the scorpion and the, let's just call it a, a beaver that fl moves across the pond? He's like, I'm not getting you on the back. You're a scorpion. You'll sting me. He's like, no, no, I promise I won't. I promise I won't. Okay, fine. So the little bear, beaver, whatever the fuck it is, plus scorpion get on his back and halfway across or the other and he stings him. And as the beaver's passing away, and he says, hey, you said you weren't going to do it. He's like, I'm a fucking scorpion. What do you expect me to do? Same thing here. What do you expect? Of course they're going to have you crunch. They don't care about you. They care about their stockholders. They don't care about them. They care about their stockholders only in that it enriches their own fucking life. Workers across the industry are done letting executives make reckless and harmful decisions, and the rock star workers are showing us the start of what's to come if they're continually ignored. There's no better time now than to join our union and push for this to be the healthy and sustainable games business that we know it can be, this same employee added. Now, here's what I will say where this guy's right. There are very rare times when you can have a corporation like this over a big fucking barrel like this. If these guys en masse, and not just the QA guys, and I've always said I'm a fan of unions and games, but you gotta have those top tier people that they cannot replace lickety split. If those guys and gals start saying, hey, we're not coming in, fuck you. Fire us, fuck you. Who are you gonna replace us with that knows the code, that knows the engine, that knows the systems? Sure, go ahead. And, and, and push your game out instead of the extra eight months that you would need if you don't crunch us, push it out two and a half years. It's a good time to do it, but they gotta have more and then just a bunch of QA people, which is historically the people who get into these video game unions, which are as hardworking and important as they are, there's a lot of people who can do that work, uh, both outsourced and just that will fill in the roles that uh, that they walk away from. Not every position in QA is like that, but the lion's share of the workers are like that. So this will be interesting to watch and see what happens. I have no problem if they want to extend the schedule and treat their people better. But looking at the video game industry right now, that certainly is not the way business has been done. Maybe this will change it. I hope so. Let me give you two numbers, 96.8 and 3.2. Those are percentages, by the way. Amazon's U.S. figures for the holiday season that we just came through. MetaQuest 2 and MetaQuest 3 VR headsets sold about 97% uh, compared to PlayStation VR 2's 3.2. 2%. This is all kind of gaining some steam in terms of discussion from an article that IGN wrote basically called Sony seems to have abandoned the PS VR 2. I mean, what do you want? No shit is the I mean, I can sit here and give you a bunch of figures and nobody needs that. You can go read the goddamn thing. But the, the gist of it is it's expensive. Uh, Sony's laid off a bunch of the studios that make games for it in terms of like London and Fire Sprite guys, which made the, the biggest game they've ever had for it, which is the Horizon uh, Call of the Mountain, whatever it was. There's no games coming as far as we know, really. And if you compare it to other VR headsets on the market, specifically the MetaQuest, which is cheaper, better in terms of you don't need to hook yourself up to a PS5. And my God, just go over to their website. I, I have a MetaQuest 2 and I'm getting emails all the time about new games and new apps and things like that. Uh, their mixed reality stuff is really cool. It's not as good as Apple's, but you know, it's pretty fucking cool. Uh, I would still recommend this, uh, and I will be getting one of these pretty soon for people who want to get into VR or AR. Hell, uh, Asgard's Wrath 2 is a 10 out of 10 game, at least according to IGN. Let's check out the Metacritic. The Metacritic for Asgard's Wrath 2, it's not just IGN, 87 out of 100. User score, 8.8. .8. Now, I haven't played this game, but I'm just saying that that's, you know, Meta's a company that says, hey, we have a piece of hardware, and we're going to support it with first party, third party, we're going to do exclusives, things like that. Sony seems, I mean, look, I understand that the first pass, the PSVR 1, was sort of one of the first on the field, I get it, but how... I. The, Look, all my time at Sony, I never heard this was a thing. That they would green light hardware and then they would put it out there even if they knew it was going to fail because maybe there was a tax thing or there was a kind of like what Warner Brothers is doing when they're canceling movies and deleting them so they can basically take a loss. Maybe that's what's going on because short of that, 
what you have to assume is that the people making these decisions at Sony, whether you're talking the PSP, you're talking the Vita, the PSVR 1, the PSVR 2, the Move controllers, uh, I think there's been a couple other little peripherals. You have to assume they just don't learn. And I don't think that's the case because they're really smart. But then again, you got the new head of PlayStation or interim head of PlayStation saying, hey, uh, everybody from Bungie on down, they're brilliant, they're creative, they're talented, they're geniuses, but they don't really understand business so good. Now, I, I think that's me obviously paraphrasing and, and making and simplifying. Certainly Jim Ryan understood business. Certainly Scott Rohde understands business, although he probably, I, I'd be stunned if he was like, yeah, let's make the PSVR too. But it's a little weird. I'm waiting for the book to come out on the, the inner workings of Sony that I never even got access to because I don't, I've never understood how they justified these decisions. Anybody, a kid in a entrepreneurial club in middle school could have looked at this and said, why are you green lighting that? It's expensive. You got to have a more uh, uh, incredibly expensive uh, PS5 to run it. You guys never support your fucking uh, games. What are you doing? So, I mean, there's nothing to say. IGN is basically calling it out. I feel bad for those people, especially the, the you know, the, the, the younger people who like, you know, this was their big, you know, gift or purchase or whatever. And now they're just kind of sitting there going, what the fuck, man? I mean, this, this burned a lot of people. The uh, analyst Piers Harding Rolls, come on, man, with a name like that, what else are you going to be? Uh, told IGN in an interview that because Sony had positioned its VR headset as a support product for the PS5, combined with slow sales, that the third party VR game devs will be looking at the Quest ecosystem as a less risky proposition. You goddamn right. Rec Room, you know, Rec Room, if you played any VR, it's one of the biggest, not that it's big, comparatively speaking to console games, but uh, Rec Room has uh, over 3 million active users. It's kind of like a social space where you can play games, and it's like Roblox VR, but a little bit less uh, janky. But the CEO of that company said on Reddit a couple of weeks ago, the team could not justify porting the game on PSVR 2. You are the biggest video game company in the world, or one of them, Sony, and you're hardware is so poorly supported that one of the biggest games on that particular type of hardware is like, yeah, you don't sell enough units. You don't support your shit enough. I mean, that's crazy. A developer at one major PSVR 2 release told IGN, Sony would only market their game exclusively with PlayStation blog posts. Any additional marketing had to be done by the developer the publisher. It's crap. It's a crap, not the, po not the product. Product's clearly great, but it's product nobody wanted, nobody needed, and if this had been their first dive into VR, I could appreciate it. I could understand it. But this was the follow-up to a console peripheral that, while they supported it pretty good, nobody wanted, nobody needed. I'm not saying there weren't fans. Don't come at me. I had one. I enjoyed some games on it. I, you know, but let's be clear. We're not walking around the Oasis with you know the Ready Player One fellas at this point. Okay, So it didn't come close to becoming what the anticipation was. And in that... To do this again, more expensive, and to do it without any real support? Well, I, I don't know. My dear friends, my dear friends, we did it. What do you think? Did we like the format? Do we hate the fucking format? We're still doing the live streams. I'm not getting rid of the live streams. I know there are people that like, but I want to fucking hang out. I like that energy. That's coming. That's not going anywhere. But as a show about video games, about the news, about analysis of the news, about war stories, being somebody who lived through some of that shit, do you like listening this way more or less? That's all I'm after. It's just a little answer. Just a little answer. In a soft touch. On a Thank you for the support. Thank you for watching. Thanks for being here. We'll see how this test goes. But regardless, I hope to see you on a future uh, Gabin and Games. Be well. <laughs>